So we're continuing our review of the advanced paper. We're now going to have a look at the differential calculus questions. And the first one that we find is actually the very first question in the entire paper. Question one says differentiate e to the power of 3x squared. So what we've got here, this function y equals e to the 3x squared, it's of the form y equals e to the f of x, where our f of x in this case is this 3x squared up in the index there. So in order to differentiate this, what you need to remember is that we're going to use the chain rule. The derivative dy on dx is equal to, first we differentiate the inside function, which in this case is the index, so you'd get f dash x. Then you differentiate the outside, which is e to the power of some stuff. Um, e is special because when we differentiate e to the power of something, we generally get e to the power of something, whatever you started with. So it's just going to become e to the power of f of x. That's the outside derivative. If that's something that you struggle to remember, then do recall it is actually found on the reference sheet. So here's the differential calculus section over here on the left. Uh, if you go over here on the left-hand side, all the way down, here is the particular version that we're looking at, uh, y equals e to the f of x, and there's the result for the derivative on the right hand side. So if you're struggling to remember it, it is there, but it's faster of course if you can just do it straight off the top of your head from memory. Let's go ahead and do that now. In this case, since f of x is 3x squared, f dash x will be 6x. I've multiplied by that index, the 2, 2 times 3 gives us the 6, and then we reduce the index by 1 from 2 to one, we of course don't need to write x to the power of one. So there's my f dash x, and then I get left with e to the power of f of x, which was that three x squared we saw before. And that lines up with answer C. Have a look at question two, same deal here. It's another chain rule question, but this time with a trigonometric function. So we're gonna deal with the inside, then with the outside. The inside function here, if I'm differentiating tan, of 2x minus 1. Here's my inside, inside function, 2x minus 1. When you differentiate the 2x, you just get the 2. When you differentiate that negative 1, you get 0. So here's my inside derivative, 2. Then I deal with the outside function, which in this case is tan. The derivative of tan is sec squared. So I've got sec squared. And then what remains is what the original inside function was, 2x minus 1 that remains unchanged. So if you have a look, that lines up with answer D. Right, so let's have a look at question three now. Before we get stuck into the solution for this, it's worth remembering some of the fundamentals of how to differentiate log functions like the ones that appear in this particular question. So if you feel quite comfortable with differentiating log functions, then go ahead and skip this. But for everyone else, let's remember that if I'm differentiating the basic log function, log base e of x or ln for natural log, then what we get is this very simple result here, one over x. What that means is if you're differentiating and using the chain rule, so if you've got log of not just x but some other function of x that was a little more complicated, then what you're going to get is the inside function's derivative multiplied by 1 over the inside function. That's what we get from this original result here. So it would be f dash x, there's the inside derivative, multiplied by 1 over f of x, that's the outside derivative, and you can see the parallel from the basic result to this other result. And that simplifies really neatly uh, because if you choose the right color, you can see that I can just combine these two terms, f dash x and one over f of x into one, um, still using the wrong color. Um, you can see that you get this nice neat fraction here, f dash x over f of x, which actually appears on your reference sheet. So if I just scroll down here a little bit, y equals log of f of x, and you can see on the right hand side, there's my f dash on f. It's one of the nicest, neatest derivatives to remember. So now if I want to use that for this particular question, let's have a look. I'm doing log of tan x, so there inside the brackets, that is my f of x, right there. Um, or should I say, that's the f of x as using the reference sheet, I have to be quite careful here because um, this f of x has actually been used in the question already. So I guess I can just call it the inside function. That might be a less ambiguous way to say it. So now when I go to use the reference sheet's result here, f dash x is going to be equal to derivative of the inside function, which is sec squared x 
divided by the inside function, which is 10x. Now, when I have a look at this, it's tempting to look and say, oh, I've got it, it's part B, or uh, answer B, I should say, but look carefully, that's not exactly what we've written. We've written sec squared x on tan x, and so there's that subtle difference there, there's no power appearing here, so B is not the answer that we want. Um, in order to see which of the other answers that this is going to be closest to, we need to do a bit of simplification using our trig identities. So it might help if we write this out a bit longhand, sec squared x divided by tan x because sec squared x is a reciprocal identity, so it's short for 1 over cos squared. If you're one of the people who has trouble remembering which of the reciprocal identities refers to the other ones, what do they correspond to, because we don't use them all that frequently, there's kind of a bit of a cheap hack. It's coincidental that it works, but um, it works, so I'm going to show it to you anyway just in case you haven't seen it before. These are the three reciprocal identities, cosec, sec, and cot. And if you look closely at the third letter of each one, it tells you what it's the reciprocal of. So cosec is the reciprocal of sine, sec is the reciprocal of cos, and cot is the reciprocal of tan. Um, like I said, it's a bit of a coincidence that that works out, so it's not, don't make too much of it, but um, it's a nice, easy, memorable way to convert from sec squared, in this case, to 1 over cos squared. Now, I'm then dividing by tan x, which I'm also going to write in long form because I can use that to cancel a little bit. It's sine x on cos x. Let's get rid of that division and uh, take the reciprocal of the second fraction. So I'm getting 1 over cos squared multiplied by cos x on sine x. So this now you can start to see where the simplification is going to happen. Let's move this guy out of the way. Uh, when I have a look at this line here, I can do some cancelling. That cos x on the top is going to cancel with one of the cos x's on the denominator. That leaves us with one over, in fact I'm going to leave them as two separate fractions, one over cos x times one over sine x. Now when you just glance up to those solutions that are offered, again, this is none of the options that's there unless we go back to our reciprocal identity. So one over cos, that is equal to sec, and one over sine is equal to cosec. And you can see that gives us answer C as our solution. Now I will just quickly pause and notice that you can actually solve this in a different way. I wouldn't recommend doing this in the exam because this way as you'll see is longer, but it's always good to know there's multiple paths through a question and part of what we're actually assessing for is your ability to know what the different paths are and be able to use the most appropriate or the most efficient one. So let me just show you one other way to do this that in another question might actually be more useful for you. Before jumping into the differentiation, go to f dash x equals blah blah blah, what I'm going to do is look at f of x first. So that's log of tan x. I'm going to write this solution in a different color just so you can distinguish the two. Now, if I have a look at log of tan x, before I start differentiating, I can actually simplify this a bit further, or at least write it in a different form. That might mean I don't have to deal with such a complex use of the chain rule. So I'm going to write this as log of sine x on cos x. So what we saw before, now you might think why, why do this now? Well it's because one of the log rules we know is when you're dividing inside the log, what that's equivalent to is subtracting log. So log of sine x take away log of cos x. Now if this was not something that was immediately apparent to you, in this question it was no penalty, but in other questions you are going to need to use those log laws. They weren't the focus of this question, but they kind of linger in the background there. And just like with index laws, uh, you kind of need to be very confident and fluent in those so that you can then concentrate on the calculus in these questions. So if that was not a result you, didn't, you saw immediately, don't worry about it, but let me show you how you can now use it. This is the way that I've written f of x, so now I'm going to begin differentiating. And it's the use of this same result that we had before, inside derivative over the inside function. So what's the inside derivative for log of sine x? It's going to be the derivative of sine x, which is cos x. Um, divided by the inside function, which is sine x, so that's this guy over here. Then I subtract because that is the operation between them and I repeat it for this second function. So take away log of cos x. When I differentiate that, here's the inside derivative minus sine x. Watch for the plus and minus signs there. And then I divide by the inside function, which in this case is cos x. 
All right, so what do we got here? Um, cos x over sine x, I'm just gonna leave that for one moment. I will take that double negative and I'll say, well, that's a plus, and I'll write it as sine x over cos x. And now I've got two functions with, uh, or two fractions rather, with different denominators. So I need to get a common denominator so that I can actually combine these two. Um, the common denominator I'm gonna use here is not sine x or cos x, but sine x times cos x. So if I multiply this first fraction by cos x over cos x, I will get cos squared x over sine x cos x. So I haven't changed that fraction, I've just multiplied it by cos over cos. And for the second fraction, to get the common denominator, I'll multiply it by sine over sine. So that gives me sine squared x over, now I've got sine x cos x, my denominators are now matching. So I've got common denominators, which means I can combine these two fractions into one. I've got cos squared plus sine squared, all divided by this sine x cos x common denominator that I saw before. But if you have a look at this closely, cos squared plus sine squared, this is an identity that we learned last year. Cos squared x plus sine squared x, no matter what the value of x is, you can go ahead and test it on your calculator, it's always equal to one. So that's something we actually get from Pythagoras' theorem. Um, this is why this is often called the Pythagorean identity. So you can go back to the unit circle if you want to understand uh, why this identity works out and how come it becomes so simple. That's divided by the sine x cos x that we got as our common denominator. And from this point, you can see this leads us to where our working was before. Now, like I said, this is probably not the best way to solve this particular problem. That's why I didn't show you this solution first, but it is another path. And often the only way that you can progress to a particular question when it's dealing with logs is to use some of these log laws that I just showed you, like, like this one here, converting a single log and breaking it into two. So if one of the lessons that you wanna learn out from this is to revise your log laws, then hopefully that's useful for you.